Welcome to a Tuesday edition of Beyond the Arc alongside our NBA insider, Bill Ryder, still in an undisclosed location, and Ashley Nicole <laughs> Moss in studio. Fun fun games last night, gang. Well, fun depending on uh, your perspective, but generally speaking, fun games. Yeah, I mean, it's fun a great you, day to be a Knicks fan. I can tell you that much, baby. <laughs> I don't know about being a Sixers fan, but it's a great day to be a New York Knickerbocker. I know that much. <laughs> Pretty good day to be a hoops fan too. I mean, that was. I know you both have an emotional investment. I was nervous on each of your behalf. Yeah, that was that game, the late game. What a what a great night of basketball. Yeah, the Lakers Nuggets game was absolutely insane. I mean, obviously we'll dissect all of it. One of my favorite parts though is the games were really good, but the press conferences after were the real icing on the <laughs> cake for me in yeah. both games in both series. The uh, losing teams did not disappoint when it came to sound bites. So I'm very excited they, to dissect those more than I am to dissect the game. Yeah, they definitely did not disappoint. Later in the show, we're going to get to some of that. We're also going to preview the three Tuesday night games. And the Sixers, as Ashley alluded to, they lost again on Monday night, and they were big mad afterwards. But first, the Lakers also lost on Monday night, and they too were big mad. The Nuggets won game to 101-99, to Jamal Murray, hit a game-winning fadeaway corner buzzer beater over Anthony Davis to take a 2-0 lead in the series. Nuggets trailed that one by 20. Now they have won 10 in a row against the Lakers, including all five this year. Murray had 20 and the game winner. He also had a very different take on how that buzzer beater went down than Anthony Davis. Let's hear from both of them. I, I jumped I jumped pretty high. I faded a lot, and uh, I just lost my balance and fell. And uh, I just saw the ball over the rim. I think AD was in my way, or some, some, somebody was in my way. Um, and I just heard everybody scream. That's how I know it went in. So it was a pretty cool moment. Jamal Murray made a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop, Bill. Uh, I don't blame Anthony Davis. He played out of his head, although he was like a little bit farther away from Jamal on that shot than probably he wanted. But I mean, what are you going to do? He's fading away from it. But Anthony Davis, 14 points. Uh, 19 rebounds, 32 points on 14 of 19 with 11 rebounds, sorry, and then a steal and a block. He played great. They played great until they blew the lead. I don't know what else they can do here, Bill. Yeah, unless you're going to swap out your coach, right, In, in I guess at, at the halftime yeah. or maybe after the third quarter. You said it. I mean, this is – I don't usually want to overreact to single games in the playoffs when you're talking the first couple games of a series. We know these series are long, but this is actually soul-crushing in a way that maybe it won't be for the Sixers. I know that was brutal, but this is, to your point, John, Anthony Davis was having a, a career playoff performance in the first half. LeBron James was duly rested for a second-half spurt of energy and excellence, and he was really, really good. D'Lo turned into Steph Curry in the first half, and they had that 15-point lead at the half, and then they, you, you noted they, they got it up to 20. It just the, I know it's an old cliche now, and I know that the gifts are everywhere, but whatever, Thanos, the, the Nuggets are – inevitable and ask John I if you're the Lakers and you put together that kind of a recipe and Jamal Murray was awful from an efficiency perspective for huge chunks of the game it's just I don't know if you can draw up a better recipe than what you did if you're the Lakers and the fact you still lost that game and blew that 20 point lead it's it is a brutal brutal way to go down 2-0. Yeah, I mean, to your point, Bill, blowing the 20-point lead, look at James, 26 points, Davis, 32 points, Russell, 23 points. So they're quote-unquote big three. Everybody pulled their weight plus 20. But also the thing that is just most fascinating to me is not only did they blow a 20-point lead, but they were shooting better from the field, 48% to Denver's 44%, and shooting drastically better from the three, 43% to Denver's 23%. So it's not like they weren't playing great basketball. They just could not go ahead and do one of two things. They couldn't close out the game, took their foot off the gas. And also when we talk about the Denver Nuggets, I say this all the time. One thing that just makes them so impressive and it reminds me very much of, you know, the Golden State Warriors in their dynasty era or the San Antonio Spurs in their dynasty era. They never get too high or too low. They just remain a steady pace and are just constantly focusing on one possession at a time. And those last three minutes were just a true example of that. Jokic, everybody on the floor, not getting rattled by the fact that they're down and the clock's winding down, just simply playing smart, concise basketball. And that's very hard to compete against, even when you're playing at your best, because it's a mindset thing. And the fact that the Lakers were unable to compete with the mindset 
and just the overall calmness of the Denver Nuggets, which ultimately swung the game in their favor. I don't know what else you can do. This is debilitating to look at that stat line, to look at those team stats, and still walk away with an L. I, I would be very, very worried and frustrated if I'm the Lakers, LeBron James and Anthony Davis especially. The mic drop said it all. They know there's nothing that they can do. Their back's against the wall here. I'm glad that you brought up the mindset because LeBron went for 26 and 12 assists. He was His passing was exceptional last night. D'Angelo Russell, Bill and I were talking about it uh, in the preview last night on HQ when they asked us, hey, what do the Lakers need to do? And I was like, they got to shoot better. They got to shoot from three, too. D'Angelo Russell had a great game shooting. He had seven threes, 23 points, much better than they performed in game one. And still they lost this. So their mindset afterwards was uh, sort of prevalent across the NBA. And that was complaining. Here's LeBron James and what he had to say about the game and the referees afterwards. I don't understand what's going on in the replay center, to be honest. I said it. I think I said it this year or last year, or whatever. D'Lo clearly gets hit in the face on a drive. What the f do we have a replay center if it's, it's, it's going to go? That doesn't. It doesn't make sense to me. It makes no sense to me. It bothers me. I'm sorry to answer your question, but that is like. And then I just saw what happened with the uh, Sixers Nick game too. What are we? What are we doing? Ooh. I mean, so I hate not this. for nothing. I not hate for nothing, this. Ash. But hold on. so this is a team that was up 20 points. Right. You've lost 10 in a row to the Denver Nuggets, right. and you're blaming the refs. Look, you're Preach. the goat. You are the greatest of all time to have LeBron set up there. And we're going to get into the Sixers doing the same thing later on. A lot of people complaining about the refs right now. Time to for me look in the mirror. Time for the Lakers, Ash. Yeah, it's. It's, first of all, why the Knicks catch a stray? We're minding our business. Like, why we get roped into your situation? That's first of all. It reminds me of the 50 Cent meme. Like, what? why is it F me? What did I do? Um, No, like, it's frustrating, right? Because when you think about the greats, greats don't go to the podium and blame the referees when they blow a 20-point lead. You can go ahead and talk officiating all you want. This wasn't a, this was a game that shouldn't have even been close. It got close because you allowed it to get close. And instead of looking in the mirror and blaming the guys in the same jerseys as you, you want to blame the, blame the officiating? LeBron, this is, this is corny. This is weak. I'm not a fan of it. You should be better than this. And this is why people have their opinions about who's the GOAT, who's the not the GOAT. Like, the mentality, I'm not a fan of because the referees did not lose that game for you. You lost that game for yourself, and the guys in the jerseys next to you lost that game for you. Don't blame the officiating. That's a cop-out. I, I, that's it. I mean, co-sign everything Ash said. I know we're going to get into the Sixers in a second, but that's a different kind of loss because it's just a flurry of weird plays and great plays by the Knicks in the last 28 seconds. This is a Lakers collapse. This is a collapse over the, over an entire half. And it is, for, for lack of a better term, loser energy. I think, John, you said it. Great. By the GOAT, you're you're the greatest of all time, and I think LeBron is, and you're giving loser energy down 2-0. That's not it either. It's the, the, the perspective of the way you guys played isn't acceptable, but that's not leadership. And you still got to go try to win some games against this Denver team at home. I do think that the NBA has kind of set itself up for this discourse, though, because Ashley will no doubt remember earlier in the season when I believe Jalen Brunson got bowled over in a Rockets game and there was a no call. The Kelly Oubre thing against the Clippers where there was a no call at the end of the game and the Sixers got kind of screwed over by it. Swallowing the whistles post All-Star break has been a thing. It's basically been NBA Jam rules, and now we're in the playoffs, and you got guys like LeBron, and soon we're going to talk about the Sixers complaining about this. They kind of asked for it, but we're and going John, to continue. real quick, though, before we go to break, those were close games. There's a reason to be upset about that because that could have swung the game in one direction or the other. We're talking about blowing a 20-point loss. It's not the same, LeBron. Like, stop it. It's not. Uh, I mean, that ended up being a close game, though, and the Sixers game was a close Shouldn't game. So I'm, close all I'm game. saying is that the the NBA has sort of like positioned itself to get yelled at by a lot of people for its refereeing, and we are going to continue uh, refereeing Discourse 101 on Beyond the Arc right here on CBS Sports Network coming up.
All right, welcome back to Beyond the Arc. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please download and subscribe and leave us a review. All right, so uh, a lot of people angry at the referees, not just LeBron James and the Lakers. Sixers also angry at the referees after losing game two to Ashley's New York Knicks on Monday night, 104-101. Incredible late shot by Dante DiVincenzo following what can only be described as a rugby scrum, but they were letting him play. Uh, Knicks take a 2-0 series lead. They have now won seven in a row. Credit to the Knicks. They have closed tough games, three t- three tough games in a row, the two Sixers games, and then the last game against the Bulls in the regular season. So they're cruising. I want to bring this up real quick. The Elias Sports Bureau says that in the last 25 years, only four teams have won a playoff game, when trailing by five points with 30 seconds left, and the Knicks are the first team to do it in regulation. The Sixers really blew it, and the Knicks really didn't. And then afterwards, Joel Embiid, also very angry. He went for 34, 10, and 6. But he doesn't think the Knicks are the best team in this series. Home and, and try to turn this thing around. We should be 2 and no, so, you know, we're good. We're going to win this series. Uh, you know, we, we're going to win this. We know what we got to fix. We did a better job today, so we're going to fix it. Uh, but with a better team, and we're going to keep fighting. <laughs> There's Ashley's tweet there. Better team, cut it out. You're down 0-2. Ashley, uh, this was on your radar. This was on my radar, too. I, I always think yeah. that, uh, you know, the team that's losing, trying to claim that they're the better team is kind of weak, uh, but take it away. Yeah, so there's a few things here that I don't like. One, if Joel Embiid is going to go ahead and put that narrative out there, you might want to look the people in the eyes that you're talking to. Your hand and your head looking undefeated or defeated rather, just really like feeling sorry for yourself. Don't know if you are on the verge of tears. Just doesn't really get the message across that you're the big bad wolf and that the 76ers are better than the Knicks. But what I don't appreciate about this is that if you go back to the year 2022, right, I believe it was when the 76ers were facing the Raptors in the playoffs. Joel Embiid got on the podium and said to Nick Nurse, stop complaining about officiating. But now, two years later, now all of a sudden the officials, the officials, the officials are the reason why you're losing, (laughs) but they're not the reason when you're winning a series. It's like Uh. pick, pick an argument, stick to it, and I'm not... And you know what? I actually give credit to Joel Embiid. He does not look 100%. He's out there giving it everything he has. He's dropping 30-plus points in this series. He can barely move. He can barely run. His lateral is a disaster. And he's still out there giving it all that he has. And he's coming up short. It happens. You're also at a disadvantage because you are hurt. Tyrese Maxey got, you know, locked up in certain situations. And, yes, on both sides, were there officiating that was a little bit, eh, I don't know about that. Yes, it's the playoffs. This happens. We've seen it in a multitude of different series across the playoffs since they have started. But don't use them as a cop-out as to why you are losing. Say, we lost this one, but we're going back to Philly, and you know what? We're going to defend our home court the way that they defended theirs. I'd have more respect for that. I don't have respect for this, and he should be better than this. Ash, I'm with you on the officiating. I 100% agree. And by the way, Tyrese Maxey trying to get the foul call can't just hand the ball to a couple New York Knicks. I mean, let's... And I'm, I'm with you on the eye contact. That is a great point, and I hadn't thought of it. I, I will play the contrarian, though, because I prefer my superstar saying that they're better down 2-0 than what LeBron James did, which is doing nothing but whining and complaining. And he's probably wrong, but he's not necessarily wrong. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inject a little hope like into this? John's life. Because um, but we're the better are... team. No, so... We're the better team. There's a theory of, well, there's a theory about that, actually, Ash uh, and Bill. Just real quick, that whole bit, after game one, he came out wearing sunglasses and this whole bit that people think that he there's something going on with his eye and he's trying to keep right. it from being in the camera. I'm just I'm just saying that it could be that. Is he That's wearing sunglasses point. during right. the game? I mean, he's playing pretty well during the game, but here just okay. it's worth noting. And and look, I don't know if they're going to win this series. I don't think it's impossible. Six of the last 10 NBA champions were down two one or worse. Four of them faced an elimination game and. Only one, John, were down 2-0, but it was the Milwaukee Bucks one in 2021. So there's just – and a few were down 3-1 in, in various series. It is, there is a history of these things. And until a team wins the game on the road, there's still a scenario where teams can win. Mm-hmm. And I, Ashley, I'm taking nothing away from your Knicks. No, I agree I with you. I think both these teams are dynamic. Mm-hmm. I, I think the Cavs and the Magic are both garbage, and it's really lucky for Boston – that they've got these two teams, your two teams on this side of the bracket, and maybe, maybe, maybe the Bucks. I do. I think they're garbage, but there you have to have some luck that goes with the grit and the greatness, and all that happened. And even even Tibbs talked about this. That shot that Brunson hit, that first three, the physics of how it hit the rim. And he was having such a bad shooting night. 
and then seemed to jump up and somehow like like a breeze moved it. Look, it counts. But if I'm Embiid or I'm a teammate of Embiid's, I like the guy saying, we're the better team. We're going to win this series. You got to believe it and you got to back it up. But good for him. I prefer that than LeBron James just being petulant about, about the officiating. Not, not surprisingly, uh, Embiid was not the only person to have some things to say after the game. And it actually brought up Nick Nurse complaining about the referees previously. Very good point. And Bill, you were talking about that end of play scrum where Maxi kind of just coughed up the ball. Before that, there's a video. You can see it online. You can see it on Twitter where Brunson's clearly tugging on Maxi's jersey, which was a foul, but they let it go. And they let a lot of things go uh, in that game, including Nick Nurse claiming that he was trying to call a timeout. He was angry about all of it. Here's what he had to say. Obviously, we we uh, they score. We take a look at getting it in quick. We don't get it in quick. Uh, I call timeout. Uh, referee looked right at me, ignored me. Went into Tyrese. I called timeout again. Then the melee started, and yeah, I mean, I, don't know, I guess I got to run out onto the floor or do something to make sure and get his attention. But I. Needed a time out there to advance it. Would have been good, but couldn't get it. Yeah. Here's I'm, the thing about this, though. The internet exists, and there's right. a Pruder film that you can find right. on Twitter. <laughs> Worldwide Wob. Put it out. No no doubt. Because I, I listened He's to what he said. He's pump faking. He pump faked it. And, and then afterwards, people were breaking down the video, and quite clearly, he tries to go to call a timeout and then doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then now, on top of all this, Bill, the Sixers are lodging a protest with the league. The whole thing is they're not covering and themselves in the energy. That, it's fair. I, it's And it is a good point, and I want to be made about the Lakers. I, you can't conduct yourself this way in LeBron's case if you're the GOAT, or in this case if you're Philly and you actually think you're the better team. Because you're right, the, the post, they're not going to replay the game. They're not going to change the entire NBA schedule. They're not flying everybody back to New York City to have a go at the Garden for Game 2, 2.0. So it... It, it is ugly. It does, in, in some ways, I'll say this, in a way that I think it's more defensible that, that people are reacting poorly in Philadelphia than they than they are in L.A. They lost that game in 28 seconds. I mean, that and the Knicks earned it. I mean, it, it was a, that was one of the most sensational endings I've ever seen. I know it's not for an NBA championship, so, but in a vacuum in the postseason or any game that matters, that was amazing. And when things like that happen, when Brunson hits that crazy, sort of lucky, but amazing three-point mm -hmm. shot, and when Hartenstein just keeps getting offensive rebounds, and when it gets back to DiVincenzo and he buries that, that is that is actual heartache that isn't the same thing as the Lakers, I think, blowing a 20-point lead. So I'm going to give these guys a little more slack for acting like kids, but you're right. It's childish, and Nick Nurse, is, as you said, there's a McGruder film, and bro, be careful in the modern era. Don't say you did something when you're at a basketball game as a coach if you didn't because there's going to be this thing called cameras that are watching. Yeah, you can clearly see he pump fakes a timeout and tries to call and then calls it again once he sees the ball is loose. So like if you're going to lie, make sure there's no evidence about you lying. But also I feel like we're talking about a team <laughs> that has the reigning MVP on it. And whether or not you agree he was the MVP or it should have been Jokic, he has the award. And this is just so unbecoming of a team that has the reigning MVP on it. You're copying pleas from officiating. You're filing grievances. You're throwing up in arms because you're down 0-2. As the reigning MVP and the coach of the reigning MVP, you should be going on that podium saying, we're down 0-2, but we have the best player in the league on our team. We're going to be okay. What you're doing is embarrassing. Like, it's not even about a, you know, Sixers-Knicks rivalry. Like, just completely, like, taking myself out of the fandom of the Knicks. The fact that you're on the podium and you're the, the, main, the guy on your team fought back to get to this point when a lot of people, including myself, believe that he probably shouldn't even be playing. He's out there basically on one leg with a giant brace on. He's dealing with issues with his eye. He looks beat up. Blood's going through his sleeve. Like, he's out there battling. And this is how you go ahead and just, like, approach the media about the outcome of this game instead of highlighting the fact that, yeah, we're down, but... This guy's a warrior. If anybody can figure it out, it's us in Philly. Like, come on, man. Like, you're supposed to be tough in Philly. This is embarrassing. I, I'm, I'm very disappointed in Philadelphia right now. 
it's a uh, well, not all of Philadelphia. It's just so, some certain segments that play for the team. <laughs> the rest of us can look at this with eyes wide open and go, look, they they do have the best player on in the series and probably the third best player in the series. Unfortunately for the Sixers, the Knicks have the second and then four through eight best players. Like nobody else is really playing for the Sixers except for Maxi and Embiid right now. And if you had told me, Ashley and Bill, that Brunson would go eight for twenty six in game one and eight for 29 in game two, I would say to you 1000% the Sixers would win at least one of those games, but instead they Maybe complain two. about the refs. So we'll see what happens with game three. That's going to be on Thursday in Philadelphia. But up next, we're going to talk about the Tuesday previews and which of these teams that started out losing game one really needs to win game two. That's next right here on CBS Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Beyond the Arc. John, Ashley, and Bill here. Check us out on YouTube. You can find our page at Beyond the Arc CBS. Subscribe to us, hit the like button, leave a comment, find all these fun videos that we do both on CBS Sports Network and then when we do the podcast proper. All right, Tuesday night previews, gang. Wolves are up 1-0 on the Suns. The Bucks are up 1-0 on the Pacers. And the Clippers, without Kawhi Leonard, apparently uh, Kawhi was on the court I practiced today, but nobody, I don't think, saw him actually doing anything. So that's still up in the air. They're up 1-0 on the Mavs. Uh, Bill, this was kind of your question, so you you take it away here. Which of the teams that lost game one most needs to win game two? All right. It's not Pacers, Bucks for me, in part because I don't think either of these teams are getting out of the next round, and in part because the Pacers are, are mostly pretty young. I would like it to be Suns Timberwolves, but that that's not my answer, John. I know you and I have a bet on, on on this particular game. I need the Suns to win this series, but it doesn't feel like that's going to go a particular way. I don't know if we want to throw the confetti or not again, mm-hmm. but um, congratulations, you you've already you've already won this bet. I'm proud of you. I'll be I'll be buying dinner, so so it's not that game because that's I, you know, I can't pick a game. Way to go, you Ridiculous. did it. Ridiculous. Uh, or you've already won. I'll go I'll go Mavs Clippers, and I think it's a really significantly. Congratulations. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to tell my wife sorry. that I lost a grand later today. Uh, you did it. Way to go. Uh, I, for me, it's Mavs Clippers. And part of it's the reason you talked about, there's a few things here. One, these are evenly matched teams and every game matters. And obviously Dallas has to win on the road. And there's there's no Kawhi Leonard. And we don't know when he's going to return. But presuming he doesn't play tonight and without knowing when he's going to be back or if he's going to be back, you need to take advantage of every single game where Kawhi is not playing for, for the Los Angeles Clippers. And I think to a lesser degree, but for me, somewhat significant, there's a couple things for the Mavs just to play well, and that means getting a W. I need and want to see Luka be awesome. I just I know we've had that conversation, and I've written about some people around the NBA worrying that maybe like Harden back in his Houston days, the guy's awesome, but is it going to translate to the postseason? Easiest way to answer those questions is to win. And, and then I want them to reclaim Dallas the form they had that you talked a lot about, John, on the pod as we close out the regular season how outstanding they were defensively, the best defensive team in the NBA going back to whatever it was, March 7th. They need to get back in rhythm. So for me, Dallas can win this game. They're capable of beating the Clippers. We don't think there's a Kawhi Leonard. It's not must win, but it is important for them to to get on that winning foot, I think, in this series, even though it's in L.A. Um, I'm split between Suns and Mavs. Um, I agree with Bill's point. You don't know when Kawhi is going to come back. And we spoke about this last show. I say the more the Clippers are able to win without him, the less you'll see him on the court this series, if at all, because they see that they don't need him to survive this particular series. And if the Mavericks are unable to take advantage of that, they're in deep problems. Now, look, the Clippers shot 50% from the three in that game. Will they shoot like that this game? Probably not. Will the Mavs shoot as bad as they did in game one and game two? Probably not. So I think you'll see a little bit more even play. But going to the Suns and the Timberwolves, man, look, Devin Booker, five from 16 from the field, two to two from six from the three. He has to play better. Kevin Durant cannot do this by himself. And I think that there are a lot of eyes on this Phoenix Suns team because there's a lot of question marks about this Phoenix Suns team and has been throughout the regular season. I mean, we talked about them, I feel like, at nauseum throughout the entire regular season. They're never together, their big three. When they are together, they look like they have not, you know, there's no chemistry, and that's because they haven't played together. Um, They need help. And it's interesting because I really thought during free agency they did decent on the margins after acquiring Bradley Beal, and I really thought that they were going to be slightly deeper than they were this time last year, and I have been proven to be wrong because they look, I dare I even say, worse than they did last year. I mean, 
This is a team that looks like they have no idea what they're doing when they're on the court. And even Kevin Durant said, we have to go ahead and be more focused. Defensive, offensive rebounds, turnovers, they're sloppy with the ball. They got to win this because the Timberwolves are, are young and ready and they're clearly primed to go ahead and make things very hard for the Suns. So I, I'm leaning more towards Phoenix has to win this game. Even though that series is over, I love that. I, I actually want to circle back on something that Ash said, which I think is the best point for why, why it has to be the Mavs. And I had the thought of this, and it's worth, I just think, saying again. If you win this game, maybe you can pressure if you're Dallas. Maybe you can try to encourage Kawhi to play a little bit earlier than he should without knowing where he's at. And if you're right, if Mash, uh, Ash, if uh, if this Clippers team wins, it just allows Kawhi to keep resting himself mm -hmm. and you get to get him maybe in a healthier spot. I think it's an interesting point. Mavs minus two in that game is an interesting line. I saw that and I'm like, huh. All right, I guess they expect a bounce back from the Mavericks. Daniel Gafford, I don't know if he showed up in L.A. in the last game or one out clubbing or what. Maybe he should play in this game. Um, also, for the Mavericks, like, they – they have questions defensively for sure, but I want to see how they defend James Harden because James Harden, we've seen James Harden pull a one game, game one, like he comes out and plays really well. He did in game one against mm -hmm. the Mavs, but we saw that last year with the Sixers where he dropped 40 against the Celtics and everyone was like, hold on a second, James Harden, look at this. And then he just absolutely disappeared when it mattered most. So I'm wondering like what the Mavs can do to potentially confound James Harden, but who knows? Maybe big game James shows up again. Uh, the other line that kind of surprised me, we've spent exactly no time talking about the Bucks and the Pacers, by the way, but the other line that surprises me in Wol <laughs> is Wolves minus three. I, I'm I'm a little surprised by them. I mean, the, the Suns, look, Ashley mentioned this. They got beat up on the boards in that game. Like the Wolves, when they, they win the rebounding battle, they win 70% of their games. I wonder if that's going to continue. Because the Suns did find a way to win all the regular season games prior to this one, right? I mean, that's the first time the Wolves beat the Suns this season. So I want to see what kind of bounce back we get there. And then Anthony Edwards. I mean, can he continue it? Because it's it's prime time now. You're in the playoffs. Everybody saw what you could do in game one. I want another big time Anthony, regardless of the outcome. I just want to see Anthony Edwards acquit himself as the superstar that he looks like he's going to be. No, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's going to be an issue, though. I feel like, you know, Anthony Edwards, whether win or lose this tim series for the Timberwolves, I think you're going to see stellar performances from Anthony Edwards, and I think it's just going to further cement what people are saying about him, that he is possibly, if not the, one of the faces of this league for the future, you know, for the next kind of changing of the guard. So I don't think that matters on whether or not the Timberwolves win or not. But I think that when we talk about this series, the microscope is so drastically more on Phoenix than it is the Timberwolves. I don't know if people have high expectations for the Timberwolves. Like, if they beat the Suns, it's like, oh, wow, like, it's the changing of the guard in the West. Like, it's we're really in this moment. But I don't know if anyone really, if they lose, if there's going to be a lot of, like, hoopla made about that because I don't know how high the expectations are for this team when we talk about general, you know, public opinion, rather. The Suns, they don't win this. The target is on their back the minute that clock hits double zero, and it's not going to be good. John, I'm, I'm with, with you on Ant to, to the point where it's self-loathing because obviously I need the Suns to win, and I should want the <laughs> Suns to win based on our bet. But the heart wants what the heart wants. And I, I liked Anthony Edwards before Cat went down in the regular season, and I believed he could be a star. I did not realize that he was already a star and that I was falling in love with him. I, I mean, top five favorite guy to watch – right now in the NBA. And I, I think you both make the right points. Ant is going to be what he's been. This is just who he is. He's legit. No playoff experience, young guy, doesn't matter. I think he's a actual bona fide superstar. I think he's in very rarefied air. So do I want to win the bet? Yes. Do, do, I, do I want the Suns to win the series? Yes. But a part of me asks that question when the confetti falls, you know, just don't ask for whom it falls. It falls for you, right? I'm in, John. When the confetti falls for you, I'm almost halfway excited about the inevitable because I'm being serious. And congrats. I, Anthony Edwards is amazing, and I want to see him in playoff basketball. I want to get, like, a, yes, I, a a confetti. Like, what are those things? Like, the cannon, and you twist it, and yeah. it, it pops, like, at the at baby showers. When the yeah. series ends, I want one of those for the show. I'm going to pop it here live in studio when this series ends for whoever right. wins. I'm just going to – We've got – we can do it. I'm yeah. sure that the CBS Sports budget can handle that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just want to see Anthony Edwards. He's fun to watch basketball. Like, he's – he has become must watch television for me. Like I, I'm a league pass nerd and like 
I loved watching him before. Now I'm like glued to my seat to watch that guy. Cursory convo on Bucks Pacers real quickly. I would like to see the Pacers even this up just to make it a series against the Bucks. Uh, but we, we mentioned Anthony Edwards and how good he is. Joker right now, top of the mountain. But is there maybe another guy you would rather build around other than Joker? We're going to discuss that next right here on CBS Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Beyond the Arc, a Tuesday edition with John Ashley and Bill here. All right, so we're talking about Joker and how amazing he looked against the Lakers, and he goes for 27, 20, and 10 in a 20-point comeback. He throws in two steals. The guy in the playoffs is, like, nigh unstoppable. He just goes to whatever level is above everybody else. He's already probably, well, probably is the best player in the NBA. He's going to win his third MVP in the last four years. But that level up in the playoffs is just outrageous. And it got us talking about, how good he is, but then somebody posited, would you rather build around him or somebody else, Ash? Yeah, so The Athletic, as you know, came out with all these different polls, and they polled all these anonymous NBA players, all 81 of them, um, and it came out that Jokic and Wemby were the two names that they went ahead and, you know, put out there. Who would you rather build your franchise around? And interesting enough, Wemby won the vote over Jokic. Now, when you kind of break this down, in hindsight, you think, well, that's crazy. Jokic has two MVPs. He's a reigning champ, like John said. He's probably going to win his third one. But as I did more research, I don't think it was, like, that crazy. Okay, look at Jokic's numbers as a rookie, right? Ten points, seven rebounds, two assists. He played 80 games in his rookie season in 2015, 2016. Now, Wemby, this was supposed to be Wemby's bad year. When he got drafted, everybody said what? It's going to take some time. We got to give him some time. He's not going to be ready. He's coming from the European game. You know, his body's not going to be there yet. Um, let's go ahead and look at these numbers. He's averaging 21 points, 10 rebounds, three, almost four assists, and 71 games played this season. Not only that, but he's behind Rudy Gobert in DPOY, um, you know, finalist standings, if you will. So it made me wonder, and I felt like this was a good conversation to have on the show. Yes, when you think hindsight, Jokic is drastically here, but Wemby, I mean, he's starting already kind of here. So like John, Wemby, Jokic, Wemby, Jokic. Uh, I mean, if, if you got to factor in the age, right? Because Joker's 29. Mm -hmm. Like we don't get, we're starting the franchise now, right? We don't get any of the previous championships or accolades. I don't, or know, MVP what the parameter, I don't know what the parameters were. I don't know if like you this get them at the same season age. This doesn't count, I think. Oh, yeah, you don't, you none don't of get this the counts. Okay. This year. No, so it's I think, just going I think forward? The, Take it over next year in the summer, I think. I'm, I, yes, let's say that. Um, then I, Joker's absolutely incredible, but you'd have to go Wemby, I think, because you have so much more time with him. I mean, like, defensively, he's already there. As, as Ashley mentioned, he's probably going to finish second behind Rudy Gobert in Defensive Player of the Year award. And then and then for the next 10 years, he's probably going to win it. I don't know. His stocks are absolutely outrageous. He, he is an, uh, like a freak of a game changer defensively. And he's figuring out his offensive game quicker than I thought he would. You know, he was not a good three-point shooter to start the season, and then all of a sudden he became dangerous. So just because you get an extra nine years, I'd probably go Wemby. What do you think, Bill? I want to... I want to talk myself into Joker. I was trying to talk myself into Joker. But, yeah, Wemby, Wemby, the last few months, just it felt like every four to eight games he leveled up significantly. He made jumps that some guys take a year and a half in the league to make if they're going to make a jump. So let's say, okay, not this year. It feels it feels like a good bet Joker is going to win a, a couple more – can win a couple more championships after the season. So the question is, let's just say that they win this year, Denver wins this year, which they can do I think Wemby's getting two titles between now and his 29th birthday? Maybe, right? So that closes that gap. And then is that's he going to get – I mean, that's, that's the thing tougher. is it's, it's the Spurs, and now they're not going to be able to build around him, but it's not an easy place to recruit to. They draft that last regime. They drafted all those guys that last run, they, and they did an amazing job. R.C. Buford did a great job. You know what? I, I'm going to give a dumb answer, and I know it's probably dumb, and – I'm going to be the guy that's super conservative here, right? I'm going to take, I'm going to put my money not in a risky high end stock. I'm going to put it in some bond that gives me, I'm taking Joker because I know I'm getting a ring. 
I know I'm, I will, I am guaranteed to get at least a ring, probably pass it on what two or three or four or five, maybe with Wemby's everything we think. But since there's no guarantees, I don't even want to say the injury thing out loud. I guess I just did. You still want to see him be durable. I know what Joker is. I know what he is once he succeeded. I know what he is once he has, as Riley called it, the disease of more. I'll take Joker and I'll sacrifice what may be a, a, a fistful of, of championship rings because I just want a sure thing. Okay, let me, more, let me make it a little bit more complicated for you guys then. Let's say, I'm changing the rules here. Let's say Jokic Hi. and Wemby are the same age in this scenario. Does that change who you take to build your franchise around? I mean, well, the problem is I already I mean, know. I, yeah, because you already know what you you know what Joker could be. I mean, like part of the thought experiment is yeah. we don't quite know the situation for Wemby, but we've already saw seen the sample size. I mean, like literally nobody thought Nikola Jokic would be this. Okay, right? so I mean, then he's drafted in this. Let's let's take it like this: they're the, they're the ages that they are, but the window's only five years. So it's not like ten years. It's not fifteen years. It's the next five Joker years. All day. Does that change who you take? Yeah, then I then I'd go with Joker. I mean, if if we're shortening the window, the window is the big thing for me. Yeah, five year window with Wemby. Yeah, if you've got an entire career of Wemby from twenty and we've seen how good he is in year one, then I'm like, oh man. I mean, he could play for twenty years, and now we're talking about like potential LeBron territory. But if you're talking about just you know five year window where I know what I'm getting out of Joker, then it's the Bill argument where you go, oh, I'm going to at least get one more MVP, probably at least one more ring, and I don't know that you're going to get that out of Wemby that quickly. Joker feels to me like Patrick Mahomes after after Mahomes got his first Super Bowl, where people didn't want to quite have him. And not he's not going to be Jordan. He's not going to be LeBron. But that level of greatness was evident, but it was, our, okay, it was amazing, but is he really going to keep winning? And I think what we're seeing is probably. Joker, this what we saw last year and what we saw against the Lakers, and that I think he just that is who he is, and I think we are about I think we know it, but we're about to actually see what we know in terms of multiple championships and, and a level of domination for at least a few years. So I'm taking Nicola. I got to ask this question too before we go to break because producer Aaron, our podcast producer, was hot for it. At what point do we start talking about Joker and not so much in the goat conversation, but in that like? top 10, top five. Like if he wins another ring and another MVP, that's pretty rarefied air. And as Bill mentioned, like he could win yeah. more than just one of those moving forward. Like, are we starting to have a conversation yeah. about him joining he's... like the Steph level convo? He's already he, in no, that conversation for me. Um, I mean, I don't think we've ever seen somebody of his size and his not athletic build. I mean, he's not like, you know, an Adonis. It's like it'd be able to do the <laughs> things that like he's able to do. And I don't know if we'll see that for a very long time after him. I mean, it's unreal watching him play. Um, just watching him do the things on the court that he can do from almost every angle of it. I don't know how he's not in the conversation. I mean, he could possibly at this point taking the way the Embiid saga, if you will, he could have been, this could, been his, could have been his fourth MVP year. It's probably going to be his third, and it's probably going to be a two-peat the, the way that it, the Denver Nuggets are looking. I don't know how he's not already in the conversation, but after this year, whether he wins a championship or not, the third MVP alone, he has to be in the conversation, and I don't know how you don't put him in it. Here's how I don't, for, for me. He's got to get two rings, and I think he will. What? I think it's it's going to happen. I mean, there are, and I, I geek out and make these lists just for fun every year. And it's it's like we say top ten, and we should, but it's really top twelve or fourteen where there are guys where the separation is so small. When he gets to two, which he will, he is six to twelve for me. You want? And I have Steph as the I don't know fourth, fifth, sixth best player of all time. Maybe I overrate it, but I rate him highly. You got to get to four or five rings, right? Steph has four. You got Kobe has five. Obviously, Jordan has six. LeBron has four. That is, and I think he can do it, by the way. But for me, John, to be a top 10 player, two rings, and we can start looking at other stuff, three or four rings, four rings, and then we're having a conversation about, oh, my God, is he top five or six? Is he stuff like And if he gets a ring this year, I think like with Mahomes, we start talking about he, he's going to get there. And what do we do when he does win three or four or five? 
29 years old. A lot of time for this to happen. Could happen. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to discuss how the Charlotte Hornets are looking for a head coach, and they might be looking to tap into an NBA podcaster of some renown. Could be somebody on this show. We'll figure that out next on CBS Sports Network. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Beyond the Arc. John, Ashley, and Bill here. John, listen, before we dive into this topic, I just want to let you guys know I haven't made any decisions yet. I don't know who leaked this information to the press. I'm not leaving yet. I'm still weighing my options. The money has to be right. I don't know if I even want to coach this team. So just just approach this, you know, very okay. gently because I haven't made any decisions yet. I don't blame you for not wanting to coach this team. Uh, you potentially <laughs> in the running, Bill potentially in the running. Evidently, the Hornets are also going to talk to uh, former NBA player, now turned media sensation, J.J. Redick. I did not to know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, he has wanted to coach well, in the NBA for, that job. <laughs> for, for quite some time. He actually flew up over the offseason last year after Nick Nurse left to talk to the Raptors about that job. Yeah. Now he's potentially in on this job. Um, I could understand why the Hornets might want this to happen. JJ's a really smart guy. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to be around him in various capacities, both with the Clippers and the Sixers. And then also we both worked at a, a previous stop together. Super smart, really knows the game. I don't know, Bill and Ashley, why would he want this job? I guess the answer is there aren't many of them. And I think yeah. he'll have to have an agent, right? Someone who knows the inside, he'll have to have an agent, not his TV agent. He'll have to have, and there's a couple power brokers. He'll have to have an agent who specializes in placing coaches. And those, by the way, the agents that place coaches in the NBA also place GMs. So it's an amazing shell game where you place a GM and you know what that guy does. He hires your candidate or at least gives you an honest answer. Whether JJ can get jobs somewhere else because, and we talked about it on the HQ yesterday, there's no reason you cannot go from a playing career to television to a successful coaching career. And John, you made, I'll let you make the point, but the best point I heard was about the LeBron podcast, but also just Steve Kerr's a guy that, I know Steve Kerr had front office experience, but not successful front office experience, did TV and went and went on. So I think it makes sense, you're right, John, to be interested in JJ Redick. And I suppose the answer to whether he should take the Charlotte job and he needs his agent to figure it out is whether or not there will be other suitors this year or next year, or whether he's got lightning in a bottle from what he's doing in media, and this is the one chance to prove himself. And he he gets into the fraternity that way. I mean, I can see, you know, to everyone's point, totally get why they'd be interested in JJ. Listening to him just talk about the art of shooting just in general is just a lesson. It's like a master class. Um, would he be interested in the Charlotte job as a whole? I don't know. But, I mean, the idea of coaching LaMelo could be interesting. You know, he's still relatively young and maybe molding him and making him better than what he has been so far could be interesting also the team does need a lot of help rebuilding if you're a guy who likes to get his hands a little bit dirty and really have a say so in molding and crafting a team that could be interesting but i mean he's flourishing in the role that he's in now and not only on television but also in the podcast space and he has so many other things that he's doing behind the scenes i don't know if coaching is something that he would even want to do right now. And I mean, he's based in New York. His family he lives wants there. to do it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know if this is the team he'd want to leave all that to go coach. Yeah, he wants to coach, but I don't know if this is the team for him. LaMelo Ball, I'm not crazy about Brandon Miller. And then you got like Mark Williams. That's a tough call. Uh, that is, don't do it. Basically, don't do it, JJ. All right, that's <laughs> it for us today. Be sure to tell a friend about our show. We're going to be back at it tomorrow on podcast form, or if you're watching us on CBS Sports Network right now, stick around. The three of us are going to be on Spotlight coming up right after this. But for now, for our NBA insider, Bill Ryder, for Ashley Nicole Moss, I'm John Gonzalez. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you tomorrow. <laughs>